Well, welcome back, everyone, and I hope you've had a great weekend. It is going to be a big week in markets, and of course, there are a lot of opportunities that we'll be looking at. Did everyone have a great time? I hope you did, and I hope you're ready for crypto, stocks, and of course, commodities, because we'll be talking about all of them together today, along with some of the biggest opportunities happening in markets. Just to start off with, of course, we've got some little bit of sales coming in here across most of the broad market range, and we have you know, some yields up, I guess, is the story so far. But we've got the key levels coming for S&P 500 in particular. And you'll notice it's on the chart here straight away. We have a big zone in the options market, which is sitting around the 51.75 to 51.80 zone. For bulls, they're going to be looking at that level today and looking for rip rallies off that. Of course, the rallies have been pretty significant so far. If we do rip from there, where to next? 52.50 is the major. And then, of course, 5300 is the super major. This is considered a call resistance. And unless we get above call resistance, we don't really want to, well, we we're not really going to see further squeezing. So 5175, 5180 here first in the morning. But let's give a shout out to people that are joining us from all around the world. It's late at evening in, Amer in Australia. It's early in the morning in parts of America. And it's damn early in other parts of America. So welcome. Let's give a shout out to the first person in the stream today, which was Mark. Says, Good morning, Tom. How will a strong dollar affect silver trade in the present and future? Thanks in advance. No worries, Mark. We'll answer that in just a moment. We've also got Mike Jones. We've got Mike M, a lot of Ms, DB, Vincent A. And then we've got Dot, which says here, Microsoft 400 when people advise that 300 don't buy too overpriced. I thought we always said that Microsoft is always well priced. <laughs> Though I will say Ford PE or whatever it's sitting out at 38 at the moment is it's getting up there. Terry, good morning. The Russell, big silver hot dog, Stefan, Rev, and many, many others. Thank you very much for joining us. So, what's your favorite stock this week? Let's get it in the chat. I want to know which stock you're looking at potentially dip buying or potentially just an interest. What is it? Let us know in the comments right now. Let's give some shout outs to people that are bringing those through. Dave, good to hear. Have you back, man. I didn't know you were in here. Good to have you here, dude, dude. It's uh, been a while. Roman says, hey, Tom, beautiful day in Melbourne today. Spent the day in the botanical gardens. How was your day? It was damn good. And I've got to say that uh, the F1 was a little bit more interesting on the weekend. So if you managed to get to the F1, Roman, very cool. Joe says, Tom, have you seen CGC? Let's just have a quick look here. CGC. Canopy Growth, a company that was once in the echelons of death, is now coming back. And it's pretty much across all of these, these uh, cannabis stocks. There's a bit of a rally going on in them. 68% in the last session, 10.53% right now. Huge volumes, obviously ripping. These are very tough trades to get onto unless you just like, you know, trying to buy that dip and trying to rip the rip. The rip. Um, in this case, of course, where are we? We're at 8.50. That's going to be that that theoretical high that's coming in over oh, on that side. One sec, guys. Sorry about that. There we go. So that's going to be that high that we've got there. And realistically, this is a pretty important point for the markets. It's going to be that uh, that area where you expect some resistances to come through. And I think it's going to probably struggle or have some take profiting here. Now, it's wild. How do you get into a trade like this? Very difficult unless you're on very small time frames. Some people use things like anchored VWAPs on it uh, and then track them based on the anchored VWAP. The problem is it's so aggressive that it's going to be very, very difficult to, to really access uh, any, any excellent trades from here. It's also hard to replicate in your trading scenario. So I think that's pretty difficult as well. Crypto Pappy says, is BTC forming a bull flag on the two hour? We'll look at that very, very soon. Uh, Alex's NBAX, I like losing money. Goldman Sachs, so far, a few others coming through. So the first question was silver. We'll give it to him because, of course, the, the first question was silver and uh, they might have been here hours ago. By the way, smash the like button if you do enjoy the content we bring out. We've got a bit of a long-term thesis as well we're going to bring in a moment. So what happens to silver if dollar goes up? Well, silver can be traded in many different pairs. Of course, it can be traded versus the US, it can be traded uh, versus other pairs as well. So if we take a look here at silver and we look at just the spot, we don't have to necessarily always trade it via the US dollar, but that's generally how most people will price it. Now, silver hasn't broken through the key level. So obviously up here is the key level. 
and you can see this is currently resistance it still is resistance until we get really a weekly close above here i'm not too interested silver can trade positively against the us dollar but in general for most of these uh currency or you know original currencies silver gold that kind of thing you're actually going to want to see a lower dollar because you're going to want to see lower rates so rates are going to be an important factor in them so can silver climb against with the dollar it can but let's just talk usd for a few moments here and i want everybody to know why do you think the usd could potentially go up even if the Fed's considering a rate cut or going to rate cut, why could still the US dollar actually go up? What do you guys think is the reason behind that? It's this thought process that you've got to get into for trading and investing. Meanwhile, while I get that question answered by the smart cookies around here right now, let's have a look at a question at a particular chart that I wanted to do, which was I'll just quickly grab this up which was talking about the long-term plan, the long-term concepts of this current rally. So here is a chart that I also shared on our Monday Macro, and I've seen it also in our Discord community. So if you're interested in getting hold of it, you can. And the reason I want to bring it up is because it's probably pretty similar to where we're, we're currently finding ourselves. Now, I, uh, I think that this is something that you can kind of use as a semi-blueprint for the moving forward of markets. And of course, I'm not going to do too much on this. I think it is better to be relatively <laughs> behind closed doors on this one. But, but what I mean by that is that there's been, a, this is actually something I've always believed in. And that is that we go into these cyclical rallies because of the way the markets work. Now, I explained it in further detail in our Monday macro, but what I want to talk about here is that these are the last two main really big bull runs and they're overlaid with each other. And you can see that what tends to happen around this period here is a slowdown or even a slight drop, uh, which happens at the end of the year. Remember, this is very far away from each other. And then, then they go up. It sounds like a few people are saying, I'm reporting from the bathroom. It must mean my audio is on the wrong one. It certainly is. One second, guys. I'll just reload it. You're right. It's on the wrong one, guys. It's on the wrong one. All right. Which one is it? All right. Let's see if we can get that, that sucker kicked in. There we go. All right. The better? That should be better now. <laughs> wrong. Wrong. Different setup. New setup. And... Bathroom audio, I was thinking hotel audio. No, I'm not in the hotel. Well, unless my house, the hotel, it could be. So anyway, this overlay is is kind of the, the, the real idea of what could happen further on in this pretty much cyclical bull market. We've come out. Obviously, we don't do this for no reason, take a new high. We also don't do it with leading growth uh, for no reason. And there'll be a lot of different rotational opportunities throughout this cycle. So I wouldn't really worry too much. But a lot of questions have come in. Are there dips? Are there ever going to be dips? Well, funnily enough, the two overlays here actually show that there were no dips during this component. There were sideways or what we call pullback in times. And then there were actually a few that started to drive lower uh, later on. So I think the thing is for traders and investors, we should probably just be doing exactly what we've been talking about, which is following the weekly and the daily moving averages in particular, following the trends, and then looking for those ops. So let's just go back to US 500. Again, I put in all the key levels for you this week so you can see them on the overlay here. And the first one is going to be this level here, which is, of course, 5175, 5180. There's a lot of option puts there specifically for the zero DTEs. So what that means is that if the market does come down to this level, it's probably not going to want to push underneath there unless it it's uh, going to start paying out a few of those options. And if it does pay out those options, then, of course, there's going to need to be uh, some, some hedging going on in the markets. Now, that hedging generally will drive prices further down, and it just depends on the weight at which the market sells off. So your first level today is certainly this. 5250 is your next level. Everything in between is just noise. And 5300 is, of course, the next call resistance. Uh, we are still in a positive gamma environment. I'll update you on the daily show if that changes. And from the perspective of 50-90, that's where I think swing traders will start to actually enter into short positions. So really, up until the point where you're down underneath 50-90, 50-50, you're not really going to be in a corrective market. And 
you might say, well, that's insane. How can you not be in a corrective market? Let's do a percentage. So that's top to this point here of 4%. So it's actually going to take more than 4% to get out of this current market structure that we're in. And we are in a bullish market structure. So how should we use the S&P 500? Well, of course, we could trade it. We could trade these kinds of levels if we wanted to. Uh, we could also you know, trade this type of thing. The other way we could use it is an indicator of basically when we want to be you know, holding our cash and waiting for actual proper relatively bigger dips or whether we want to be looking at potentially buying dips on certain stocks. Remember at the moment, it's single stocks and sectors that are going to be the best. Um, so that's pretty important here. Australia has done better than S&P over time. Oh, no, I don't think so. S&P has absolutely destroyed Australia in terms of overall um, overall points. Uh, Chris says here, we Americans just assume that Australia is a third world country like Tom is somehow out in the bush, flips a phone uh, on the old Apple aisle. <laughs> no. Dude, I got more expensive internet than, than in America here. It just doesn't work properly. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it's, it wasn't the internet that was doing that. It was my mic. It was connected to, actually, funnily enough, the Apple microphone inside of one of the Apple devices. That's why it sounds like a bathroom. So what we can say is Apple's AI is behind the times. So US 500 is certainly something we're looking at. The overall trends, I showed you that chart before. In general, we should be fairly positive, as we've said, throughout the next 12 months, throughout the next two years. Um, and I think that generally speaking, the market is probably going to go into euphoric booms. Now, you could argue that there is a potential switch to that. And that switch comes when the rate cut itself actually gets done. So the Fed generally boosts the market like this, or at least this is pretty much all other scenarios have kind of looked like this, you know, that type of thing. And then there's some that diverge here. Now, depending in, you've seen my daily show, depending on which scenario this is, which of course we'll update you to, will depend on whether we're actually in a proper dipping market that's going into recession or not. And you know what the most important two indicators you're going to have to have on the charts for that are? They're going to be the zero three month Y versus the US 10 Y, and of course the US two year versus the 10 year. So they're going to be the most important two uh, that, that we need to, to be looking at. So these are those charts that, that really matter, guys. Make sure you've got them on. Make sure you've got alerts set for under 1%. Are we even there yet on the three-month? Absolutely not. Have we gone underneath 1% at any point? No. Uh, will we? At some point, we're going to uninvert. That's always a dangerous area. And usually after that is where you start to go, well, question mark. And everybody believes this doesn't exist anymore. The thing is that they all have it wrong. It's got nothing to do with being inverted. It has to do with when you come out of the inversion that often can be the wrong time. So if you if you consider we came out of inversion here in October 2019, now we were only in it for a little while. And you could say, but Tom, no one could have predicted that this was going to occur being the COVID stuff. Well, yeah, maybe not that, but I bet you if you look at the market, if you look at the euphoria that was running some of those stocks at that point near that end session, you wouldn't be surprised at all to say that that was actually a pretty good predictor. You can also see here, 2007, we come out of the inversion. Now, if I overlay, and I just want to kind of reiterate this because I think people misinterpret. Now, it doesn't mean go and run away and be terrified and you know, everything like that. If you, see, if you have to see the price action come with it, but you'll notice here it front loads it. So it's one of those partially predictive things. We come out of the inversion, we sit for a while, we start to dip, and then obviously we get really big dips. Here, we actually come out of the inversion, we rip higher, then we get a collapse, all right? And now we've been inverted for a long time. In this one, we actually invert into the collapse. Um, so we actually are already collapsing by the time it's done. Now that's because we should use the US two year and the US three month and use a combo of them. But basically at the moment, we have a lot of inverted yields. They're still inverted. Uh, something to consider, something to put on your charts, and I think that's good to be there. Let's give a bit of a comment here. There's no dingoes in Melbourne. No, not to my knowledge. Uh, Boris said, would you mind going over oil and natural gas? We'll cover both. And Boris says also, hi, Tom. You're absolutely amazing at what you're doing, and it's always a ple pleasure listening to you. Thank you, Boris. I appreciate that, and I do appreciate all of you guys that come out here early in the morning in the US, late at night for Australia, and obviously afternoon for Europe and everywhere else in the world. 
because uh, it means a lot to me that 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 we've built this community that we have so many avid traders investors and hopefully people that are you know making better decisions i'm always interested to know you know have a lot of you done better with things like the idea of having an abundance mindset the thing of facing like the the plan of using price action to actually ultimately make your decisions in markets uh, to look at markets in a way that isn't really based on necessarily what every hype person is doing out there has that helped you in your investing and trading community let us know in the comments it always helps out apple 2e no not quite though i have used one of those before they were i remember our school had some horror show horror show apples <laughs> i can't remember how old they were but they were damn old all right let's keep going around the markets here so i'm sure a few of you want to look at bitcoin hey we can't not look at it why because oh we don't want to do that why because basically it is the main kind of exciting market at this stage. Now, I already took this to a two week and it looks like a long leg, long leg doji. And I think the thing is for a lot of us, what we do when we're doing analysis is we come in, we have analysis and we always look at it from the timeframes we know, weekly, daily, four hour, two hour, et cetera. Remember that the market is basically fractal. The market is made up of structure. So whether you're a supply demand trader, a support resistance trader, a structure trader, a positional based trader, at Elliott Wave Trader, it doesn't really matter. What you'll find in technical analysis is it all comes back down to finding the orders or the positions in general, and then understanding the market's fluctuations around that to trap liquidity to build positions. And, and this is one of the things I teach in one of our courses a lot, and I go on about it because it's important to not think of the market as any particular one candle. Now, I do go on about flow a little bit and weekly closes and monthly closes and daily closes because they are important. But from a Bitcoin perspective, basically, where are we? We've, we've already seen a bit of a correction. That's a 15% move. That's pretty normal inside of a upward tick. We've come down to the 62,000, which we knew that bulls needed to hold big time. And now let's go light, smaller time frame here and have a look at the daily. So in the weekend video, I put, yeah, we need to hold that zone. That's where the bulls need to hold. Now, it's not rocket science that I predict uh, that, you know, it is a partial prediction. It's actually a prediction made, made on price action. Uh, so this is actually not necessarily a full prediction. It's actually reacting to what the market's saying. And that's why I've said that this was a, you know, it's a fair buy. Now, if someone did buy here, I wouldn't blame them at all. Obviously, stops would be technically underneath this level and you'd be looking at rallies. Now, at the moment, the market is still making a series of lower highs. So we have lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high currently. So until this market gets above the 70K, you won't be sure it's outside of, of a potential still fall off. So there's two scenarios. The number one scenario is you bought in here. And at the moment, your smiley face. I wouldn't be too upset with buying there. I think it's very, very good. I think there was a reload zone here as well. And I think that probably those types of traders would be breaking even or even scaling a little bit back at the first res or what we know is the supply that was that was aimed from 68.7 which was the previous two weeks over here so it was a one two week combo so that's the first thing therefore we're at this resistance you probably want to be breaking even you would probably want to be scaling a little bit and making the next move now because it's a series of lower highs if we come down to this level here would you want to buy again while we wait for that comment and to be answered by you guys, uh, Jason, thank you very much. Ryan says here, how's it going, Tom? Here to say thank you for putting out so much free game and knowledge. I have massively helped my technical analysis skills uh, just from your YouTube videos. Very much appreciate that. Thank you, Ryan. That's great. Uh, Tom said, never can, oh, never told you why USD can go up while rates come down. It's all got to do with speed. So while we get this one, Roman, basically, if USD, let's say we've got central banks around the world, okay? So these are central banks around the world. Now, the US starts cutting rates. They cut rates twice. But the Swiss central bank cuts rates five times. The UK central banks cut rates four times. The EU cuts rates four times. In essence, what we've done is we've rate cut faster. So comparably, the USD is actually still stronger. So that's why you could you could actually be up. Hopefully that makes sense. 
Intel down 4% pre-market. Yep. PG says, it seems crazy, Tom, but I'm constantly waiting for better entry points, more often just sitting on cash. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> what I would do is scale. I would scale uh, PG. So if you're finding that you're, you're not entering, then you've got to be looking at it from, okay, is my entry criteria slightly off? Uh, should I be scaling those types of things become very, very important? Uh, no, because no higher high. No, the liquidity grab is at some time. Uh, a grab is a one-time buy, correct? And uh, would be a short time frame change. Yep, absolutely. Uh, no, etc. Yes. So what this would mean is that we would be having a series of lower highs. We have grabbed the initial liquidity. You're correct. We've pushed that market up. And you might say, I'm not interested in Bitcoin. It doesn't matter what this chart was. This is the same philosophy, whether it's a stock, a crypto, a commodity, it really doesn't matter, guys. So this is actually very, very good stuff. So what you're actually looking at here is because it makes a lower high in general, statistically, you would not want to buy that low because what that would be telling you is it's weakened. And in general, what we would do, and this is partly what I want to put in these, these uh, week, weekly shows now, and if you like it, let me know. It's kind of like a little bit of an education corner here, is we'd want to see how that candle had done it. Now, the one, the best positive sign here on the surface of saying this probably won't happen is this very bullish looking close. But see here, we had a wick and a wick. Now, if that had ended up like this and it was a rejection wick and we were down the lows, even worse, very good uh, sell actually, not a good buy. So at this point where, you know, looking at the buy side, of course, that's the trend, that's everything. But if we did get back down to this level, I would think you would have to be incredibly cautious about it. And if we take that 60,000, that 60K out and uh, break below this, the floodgates will open on crypto and you'll be down very, very quickly. So it'll be like this and it will go straight down into that level. So there's really no flaw here. And it's what some people call shelf investing now. Uh, yeah, there's, there's an acronym for everything. What that really means is that there's very little actual trade through here. So it was a fast move, but there was actually very low volume. So volume was low. It was a fast move. There was nothing there going on. And therefore, the market can move easily to the next shelf, uh, which is here. So no shelf through here, shelf in here. And that's that's generally the concept. Again, really what it is, is supply demand. <laughs> People are just clutching nowadays for everything. So that's that's one of the important factors here. Uh, Jamal C says, what are the levels of CGC support and resistance, please? It's pretty much at resistance right now. I'm sure you can do it. It's very basic TA. Uh, jam uh, the very CGC making the headlines this morning because it's rallied about 60 something percent last week and obviously up today it's not really something that I'm looking at let's go over to the stock that I am watching now I did a special on Google on the weekends did you guys enjoy that one I hope you did uh, Google looked pretty damn good now this is a little bit disappointing to see that AMD is taking the low here this morning so this this is a potential uh, day trade that won't play out here. And um, Google's obviously more of an investment. This is AMD, but this is actually structural demand. Now, what we could do here is we've seen the market obviously tank it. So the market has gone you know, well, 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 well down. We're at 22.9% technical bear market. It's actually taking the low here this morning. So it'd be interesting to see how this reacts around this zone. Oh. <laughs> I did it again. I put the a, a stupid, stupid me. I always press the wrong, wrong hotkeys. Uh, but yeah, here's the here's the low 174. So it'd be very interesting to see how this market actually makes uh, makes the trade here this morning. So if it instantly rallies off this low, remember there's going to be a lot of stop losses here. And myself, uh, potentially included, if if I don't make the decision to put it underneath that low there. So what this is is it's an aggressive play. Uh, the market obviously tanked. You don't really want it. There's no reason to buy any other tank level. So while this was tanking, this entirety of tanking is just a joke. There's If you buy that, unfortunately, a bit of a noob. Um, now, this level of structure, the actual main trade is around here at 170. So we get that initial kind of rally up, and this is a worrying close because, of course, it's sold during the close. Now we're going to be opening up underneath the low, which is going to have liquidity sitting on it. 
So I do think that there's there's a very interesting trade dynamic here for AMD today. <laughs> Mia's, Mia's loving it. Uh, I'll read your comment in a second. It's pretty funny. Uh, thank you also to the people that have joined. This one's got 700 of you live here into the open. And make sure to give it a thumbs up if you enjoy the content. So anyway, AMD's trade uh, this morning will be, can it, uh, if it does take this, will it reclaim back to the upside? And if it does reclaim back to the upside, um, that's really what you're looking at here. Just give me one sec, guys. Almost done. Okay. All right. Uh, Mia says, it's a freaking joke. The day will come. The big boys hedged already. So, yes, there's. this is talking about basically the market coming down. It says, let's cut the BS. We're on the edge of a bigger correction. It's definitely coming. It's just a matter of time. Big players left and retailers are in denial. So if you want to say cut the BS and go down that line, then basically what we'll have to do is make sure to – you know, really look at the price action. You, you're making a prediction and you're saying, okay, something like that JP Morgan chart that I showed on the weekend video, which basically what that showed was that we're in uh, euphoric heights uh, needs to have a correction of period. And yes, we're due it. I mean, what are we at? Like almost 100 days, I think, since the last one. In fact, I can share the chart here. I've got it and I have it on my phone. It has been 100 days since the last correction. So does anyone think a correction's coming this week? Because Wayne has some interesting data around that. <laughs> what do you think, guys? Is a correction starting to come this week or is it a few weeks away still? Let me just grab it up. Or is it longer? Again, I do not think this correction is going to be a crash. It's very unlikely considering the growth, and we'll look at why that's unlikely in just a moment. Okay, so here it is. Uh, here's the chart, and you can see, again, 100 days since the last 2% pullback from closing high. So it's been a while since this has happened. At previous times that this happened was the 2000 and kind of 18 period, 19 period. Then we had obviously the the other periods. Now this is a little bit sneaky data because what it doesn't show you is the generalized times that you really receive these types of things. Um, so it's more than likely you've had you know other corrective periods where it's been in inside of this. This is only one piece of data, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so it's it's not enough. Um, it's not enough to go off. I wouldn't uh, consider it. What we do have, though, is raw stats. The last time we had, we usually on average have 67 days for a correction. We're sitting at 80 plus. Uh, so we're sitting a long way away from the 67. Again, predicting stuff is very difficult in markets. If you want to be successful, generally, you've really got to make sure that you you process it from a price action based standpoint. So we know that if, if, until we under, even get underneath 51.75, the market's not even weak. That's the problem. It's not even weak. Not even weak, guys, until it gets under 51.75. So Bitcoin's key level, 60K, 52, and 42.6. This would be a sweet reload zone if you were looking at hodling for after the halving cycle. Okay, let's have a look at why this market is most likely not super weak. Now, first up, what you're generally looking at is, say, like XLP versus SPY. <laughs> so this is staples versus SPY. So if the market's weak, 
generally you'll see staples uh, defend. So if you look at some periods like 2018 into 2020, and this is a good one for you to keep on your charts in the future, it what it shows you here is it generally shows you either a slowdown period or the end of a cycle. And you'll notice that we also had XLP outperforming staple uh, outperforming the spy around these points. So it's obviously staples versus the spy. Late cycle, middle of the overall bull cycle, so like a four year run up. Then we hit into a sideways market, if you remember back at this time. And then, of course, the 2022 point. So staples are getting absolutely slaughtered versus the SPY. That's pretty normal when you're taking out these levels. Another one, which I'm obviously bullish on for a little period here, is utilities. Now, utilities does the same thing. You can see a very similar chart to the other one. Uh, we get that late cycle thing. We get that defensive cycle concept. And at the moment, it's it's still weak versus the SPY, although it has improved since we've spoken about it. And I still believe in utilities over the next you know, kind of two weeks. Uh, so utilities for me is one of the next two weeks. But this is actually a, a positive sign for the overall bullishness of the market uh, that these markets have been coming down this way. That's one driving factor. There are, of course, a lot of other driving factors. Technically, copper breaking out actually is a sign of growth. It's not just a sign of potentially reinflation. Uh, it's a sign of growth in the economies uh, coming through because demand's up. I do think that copper is going to be a very interesting play in the future. Although it's being kind of cartelled, I expect that cartel concept to continue through. Let's go over the yields though. US two year. If you really want this market to tank, you want that at above 4.77. Okay. If that's what you want, you want this above 4.77. I think that's one driver. Uh, we've obviously got a few other drivers we use on the daily show as well. Liquidity is still currently quite hot, although central bank liquidity by our own measures actually dropped a little bit last week, showing some supportive action has been taken away. Uh, no, not all shorts are trapped. I shorted on Friday near all-time highs. There will be a move, uh, be more than five waves short. NASDAQ all-time high this week if it comes again. NASDAQ will be probably the weaker of the markets. You can already see that's been instigated here uh, from the market. Almost not making new highs. It did though. So it's what we call a dull market. And there is a saying you shouldn't short dull markets. We've had a dull market for a while now in the NASDAQ. Here's where the dulling begins. Here's the dulling currently. Could be correct. Could be a top. If it is a top, then the good thing is that you know it's going to be kind of real because this would be BC. This would be UT. This would be UTAD, which is a Wyckoff style. We go underneath here. Guess what we've just done? Distribution. So if that had happened and that does happen, we don't have evidence for it yet, guys. We don't have evidence for it yet. But if we did, uh, that would be that would be a pretty negative sign. For me, until we go underneath 51.75, I can't even say this market is anything but just ripping at this stage. And and I don't want to go, I wouldn't personally, you know, try to hammer it too hard uh, unless you're using options. Options would be the only way. Hopefully, uh, you did use some options then. Mark Kerr says, how many dingoes eat babies? Uh, about 2,000 a year, Mark, if you want to look up the stats. Fly, Fly Lear 45 says, uh, what... What that means is you will take profit when somebody adds to their shorts. Yeah, that's right. And M2 to the moon, talking about, of course, M2 increasing recently, which is the cash component. Palace asks, can we have a look at the DAX, Tom? I would appreciate it. Yeah, sure. We can have a look at the DAX in just a moment. So let's check out the DAX. DAX being uh, the European market, actually outperforming many markets throughout the world right now. You overlay, let's overlay a DAX versus the SPX for a moment. And uh, have a look at which one's better. Oh, I tell you what, you wouldn't think so, yeah. But look at the look at these European markets. I mean, they're not beating it over this period. But if you were to say, let's take the low, the DAX is better. Could you believe that? If you asked me and you said the DAX is going to outperform the S and P five hundred from the lows, and we're going to see Nvidia triple to seven times over, I'd say. <laughs> Uh, it's not going to happen. But that's exactly what did happen. So again, sometimes you expect the unexpected. And uh, German market for now, still very bullish. I did have a possible scenario on it, which was one of those FIB kind of TP zones Oops. based on a FIB extension here. 
And generally with fib extensions, a lot of people like to take profits around these 618 fib extensions. Uh, also the one negative one or negative 1618 would be interesting zones, which we're fast approaching. So yeah, DAX is on a on an absolute moon kicker. The more interesting market's probably going to be the FTSE. And the reason why is the FTSE is now being heavily shorted by retail traders. And you'll notice that, uh, so they're up at now 68% on the market. Again, you might not care about the FTSE, but it's an interesting chart. Uh, look at a breakout here. So it breaks the ascending, obviously makes it to the 7,900. That is still going to be a weakness level for the FTSE. But it's kind of saying, well, I'm ready to go a little bit here. And it's old kind of businesses. We've got the energy businesses in there. You've got the uh, the financial businesses in there, some that have been improving recently. And of course, then you've got the last one, which is the materials and metals businesses. So you have a lot of the old school economy in this market and it just ripped last week super hard. That's a big one here. Uh, Duncan Dave says, Tom, some Yahoo on YouTube is preaching to sell covered puts on yin to make mad cash at a weekly basis uh, i just want to have a look so we can debunk whether that's a good concept or not china bull uh, so they're saying sell covered puts oh okay well well firstly i wouldn't generally do that uh it's the three X fund. It's very like you're you're upping your risk exponentially through this kind of component. And obviously, I'm bullish on the concept of China probably coming out on the market and doing some improvements, thanks to the government intervention, really more than anything else. But yeah, I'm not going to uh, be saying, "Oh, let's go and let's go and do anything to do with with uh, selling covered puts on this." Jason says, uh, credit card debt's all-time high because dollar deflation, inflation. Wouldn't it be higher if more dollars are in the system? Uh, it depends whether the dollars have, uh, how many have it, it, you know, escaped the system. Just remember, when it, it comes with the markets, uh, what we've generally got here is you've got a market where if the money is printed, let's say the Fed, it hasn't escaped the system. It sits in the back end with all the banks. Okay. It's when the government prints, e.g. stim checks, that it's guaranteed to be out there with everybody. So what we had here is actually COVID bought, not so much the Fed money, although some of that explained, escaped in debt systems, so obviously borrowings, et cetera. It's actually the money that came from the government stim that's flowing around. Uh, so a lot of that's purely inflationary. What do you think about canopy? We've already talked about that one. 67% last Friday is germinally legalized cannabis. I think it's like every time the cannabis stocks go up, they all rally super hard. You got to be on them for the right times and then they dump. So you've got to really be on top of them. So, you know, some examples of this, oh, I can't remember if it was sun, sundial growers. Uh, was it sundial? Sun? Probably dead now. SNDL, that's the one. Yeah, look at it. So this, <laughs> oh, this stock, this stock was loved by so many people. It looks like they've done some reverse splits. So I remember this back over here when we were live streaming it. Everyone wanted to own this crappy stock, and you you can see now that it's it's worth so much less. So it, it's purely hype, hype baby. If you want to go into the hype baby, you can make quick bucks, but it's just kind of like saying, would you like to go and jump into blackjack and double your money? And, and have a 50-50 coin flip at the market. That actually is what you're doing. You might think you're making an informed decision. The problem is where's your stop loss? Where's your risk reward? At least when you go onto a blackjack table, you know your risk and you know your reward. It's 50-50 uh, almost, or let's say 55 their way, 45 your way. At least you know your reward. The problem is down here is where's your stop loss going to be? How much risk are you taking for it? All of those types of things. All right, let's look at some other opportunities around the markets today and during this week. We'll start off here with U.S. oil. So U.S. oil is sitting right on kind of a current level of, of, of long leg dojis. Uh, you'll also notice that we have a market that is floating barely. Um, it really needs to find buyers right now. 
level to mark out this week is going to be the 82. So make sure you've got your 82 marked out for this one. A very, very important zone for US oil. If it breaks above 82, uh, Brent as well should be very interesting on the long side. Uh, we remain bullish in bias on gold. It did break technically a flag last week, which is here. And then we went up and then, of course, we weakened off. What you're looking for on, on probably gold is a 2185, I think it is, uh, level breach plus. So 2186, my bad. So 2186, you could set an alert for that. And if that happens, then I think gold could be on the rally. And that would mean weakness in the dollar. For now, dollar is at resistance, although it has looked way more positive than I would have thought it would be. It's currently at resistance. If we do manage to get a, another strong weekly from dollar, I would say dollar is moving upwards of 105.60. So very strong recoup from dollar. It's now directly on our supply levels, which you can see here we have at 104 to 104.20. is a very critical resistance for the DXY. And uh, yeah, a switch there. So it's just basically straight at resistance. Some other things that we've got going on right now are, of course, the individual stocks. So let's talk NVIDIA here for a moment, the stock that can't be stopped. <laughs> now, this stock obviously is probably one of the most exciting. You know that uh, supposedly in the crowd of NVIDIA's press conference or their conference recently, there was $100 trillion of market cap, directors, and money. Can you believe that? $100 trillion. Is that correct? I'm pretty sure it is. I looked at the names. It would make sense. That could be right, Kevin. Got to look at oddballs. Two NVIDIA has been putting the blinders on investors. Yeah, it has. <laughs> so this is a big one here. What are your thoughts about MU recently earnings uh, and NVIDIA buying their RAM? for the next year and that they have a monopoly on high-speed RAM. I think it's a positive sign for the stock. So 100, let's just put that into perspective, $100 trillion sitting there in NVIDIA's, in NVIDIA's meeting. That could be the most concentrated meeting I've ever seen ever in my entire investing, trading, thought process career. I mean, we've obviously never seen such big money, but 100 trillion that basically tells us that every single company in the world that means anything that's big in innovation is hellbent and desperate for their technology so no wonder people holding it is very good look i'm a big believer in the nvidia four trillion bandwagon uh, i obviously still think that there's a possibility we go sideways here for a little bit but i certainly wouldn't be <coughs> selling off my bags if i was uh holding um even more so, yeah, big one here. AMD crushed again in pre-market. Yeah, it's getting crushed underneath the low. We looked at it just before. Europe announces massive probe into major tech companies, Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. I, I heard that. Uh, with PCE coming in hot on Thursday, I believe this is the start of a major correction. So, yes, this is a problem. Now, we've seen the antitrust before. We can actually have a look at how it affected the markets. And specifically, we can look at Microsoft. Oh, by the way, Microsoft is, uh... okay. Oh, nasty. Is that opening up as an island reversal? <laughs> oh, no. My micro dollars. That's all right. My micro dollars might go down, but it is still so high. All right, let's go over here. So we have to go back a long history. Now, I can't remember exactly where the antitrust was. I think it was around here, but it stifled growth in these businesses for quite some time. So I think that the Wall Street algorithms will certainly know that. I can't remember if it was in here. Maybe someone can get the date for me in a moment. But um, yeah, look, central. whenever you've got governments intervening, which has always been one of the biggest concerns, it's actually very negative as well on the growth for AI. So it's actually really bad. Uh, for especially democracy. Um, if, you, if you want America to be the number one innovation, it's very bad if that does happen. But um, in general here, we've got uh, yeah data being the big story of the next decade. And if we have government intervention, it will be negative. Does anyone have a look at the date for me in terms of when that happened? RC says, if NVIDIA goes to 975, then 1,000 is likely confirmed. Yeah, I probably agree with you. 
news can help NVIDIA today. China blocks use of Intel and AMD chips on government computers. There we go. $100 trillion. Pinky at the corner of the mouth. Oh, yeah, $100 trillion or whatever they said. <laughs> That's a bad impersonation. All right, let's go over to Meta. Let's have a look at this one. Meta, Meta, Meta. Uh, the rally on rally on rally. So it still theoretically is not super expensive um, from a pure price perspective. The, the rally is incredible. I mean, obviously around 100 to 500 is pretty wild. This one here is probably a split candidate. So if you're really buying Meta at these prices, you're just banking on a split. And I, I think that's the main thing. It's not so much that the price action or the fundamentals is, it, the price action is pretty wild. It's obviously up still, uh, but you're betting on a split. And I think that's really all you can be doing here with Meta. Also, you're going into it with the idea of an election in mind. And, you know, potentially that can be, you know, relatively uh, bullish, at least initially for the, for the market. Uh, last time around, you can see here, it's got stuck just coming into that September period. But uh, yeah, look, Meta 505, uh, very high. And I would say that's, uh, that's a big one here. Uh, NVIDIA split rumors. NVIDIA is certainly split. 100% they'll split. Yeah. They'd, there's no way that they would not split in the future. So this will split. I think Meta will split. I think Microsoft might split, but it won't be anywhere near a bigger deal. Most people that hold Microsoft more the the uh, non-retail side, so they won't be as hyperactive on it. But yeah, these two, I think, are the best split candidates at the moment. We had a question about Micron before, which is MU. Set a great result last week, obviously getting a big purchase in from uh, NVIDIA as well. And this is an interesting target because we've seen it break a, to a new high. Now, it's not obscenely higher than it has been in the past. 21, obviously 22 highs now breaks out. <coughs> is this a candidate for your type of trade? Sorry about my cough there. Uh, well, it's just the problem is it, it, these aren't really trades. They're more you know positionals. And that's because where are you, again, how are you going to put a stop loss in there? Unless you're trading with options and the problem with options is going to be expensive. So it's not really a great candidate for anything other than an investor at this point. If you wanted to pick it up, you'd probably want to pick up the pullback into the long. Is it a big deal? I think for investors, uh, this certainly is, is pretty good here. SMCI will split. Uh, yep. So anything over a thousand dollars is worth it, especially in the AI space to see splits. SMCI sitting at around nine sixty nine. So AI space around a thousand bucks. I think they're no brainer split concepts at some point in the future. What do you guys think? Do you agree with that? Let us know in the comments. Uh, do you agree that most of these thousand dollar target stocks are basically split candidates? I, I really think they are. Of SMCI here, by the way, after having that uh, little bit of a fall recently, as I've mentioned, you know, I kind of thought it would go sideways for a little period. Uh, so far has, but this is a pullback in time. So if you're a long-term bull, you know, you've just pulled back a few weeks. Uh, so now, you know, you've got a few weeks of pullback. What is this? Basically one, two, three, four, five, six, so about six weeks, one and a half months of not doing much, even though it's been doing a lot. Uh, so yeah, that's good. Pullback in time is okay. A pullback even further to the 20 could be a very good candidate for it. Friend just says Pepe. I think I saw your comments. You say Pepe every single time. <laughs> I think Chipotle split. They already have done it. Yeah. AMD TA. Yeah, we'll have a look at that in a moment, Andrew. Um, we did already do it before, but AMD is copying it thanks to China News. Uh, Palantir here, 24.10. It's not necessarily a terrible price, nor is it that good. Unfortunately, a uh, Palantir has hit into its previous peakings, and this is where I think there'll be some take profit targeters for people that held it through all of this hor horror show. Uh, price action wise, if you're going to buy it, uh, the initial buy would have been $23. Currently trading at 24.10 if you were day trading it. And 
yeah, that's really your main main level. It's not my type of trade. Uh, if I was in it, I would probably consider it at around this price today with stops somewhere under here or here if if that was the type of trade that I'd like. Uh, it's not for me, but yeah, it'd be there. Let's take a look at IWM. Failure last week. No closure high. Does give us the momentum we wanted this week. Also, could be lining up with some people's thought processes here, which is maybe we're due that correction and maybe it is going to come. IWM's failure uh, is is upsetting uh, in terms of you know not being able to get that nice momentum trade on this week, but it's about two hundred five, so two thousand five hundred. If we go to the US two K, we look at two thousand uh, sorry two thousand fifty two thousand fifty. Uh, this level here is an interesting level for the market for the open. So if if it does get down to there, I would think this would allocate somewhere around fifty one seventy five ish on the S and P. So if we get down here. 2040, 2050, 5175. It's really the main level. I, I, I like the level of 5175, 5180 for the US 500 a lot. Brent says, that's me. Yeah, I see you every time, man. You copy every time. <laughs> I'm like, what is this Pepe thing? Uh, Tom, what do you think of Palantir? Will it continue its upward movement? Uh, certainly could. I think it probably will based on the way that the market's moving. But the company, I, I can't say. I think it's... A lot of speculation still. Um, you know, price action wise, it's hit a bit of a resistance until it break. If it breaks above that zone, though, uh, it should be on a good run now. PLTR possible distribution peak before pullback and long longer consolidation from Flylia. Hey, how about Snap showing some small amount of recovery, break and retest on the weekly? Might check it out in a moment. Let's go back over to AMD. A lot of people interested in this one today. Uh, China news obviously dropping it. And let's have a look here at what the news stories are. So Alibaba, interesting, hits pause on retail platform to reinvest business strategy and drive dive into AI. So there's a lot of companies behind the curve here. Looks like Apple is. A few of the Chinese stocks are probably behind on the AI side a little bit. Some are in front, I'm sure. Intel and AMD shares down as China imposes new microchip import restrictions. Yeah, so we're going to move into a lot more of this over the next couple of years. We're effectively in CW, which is currency wars. We're going to go back into trade wars. You watch it go. And um, we're going into you know a level of bringing manufacturing to every single one of the countries and bringing it all back to the home side, which is not a new movement. You guys would have seen it for quite a while now. Our AMD to watch is how it reacts to this low. There'll be a lot of stop losses here. There's obviously some structural gaps in this zone. Not a great news for both Intel and AMD. It's going to hurt them. Uh, so how it trades around here will really show you a lot about the action. I'd say that I'd say a bit of the news has already been packed in by loose lips based on the price action itself. So I don't think this is new for the market, although it's a new news story. So I wouldn't be surprised at all for it to actually rip um, after dropping off. But you'd need to see the rip first. What do you see on the PDD charts, Tom? All right, let's have a look at PDD. Then we'll do natural gas because a lot of people are liking that. PDD, yeah, the huge rally into the massive dip. It's actually a buy zone from a TA perspective. Uh, this is kind of similar to AMD's problem. When you rip and you can't hold it, it tells you that an investor dumped the position. Now, there could be something they saw in the books. It could be something that they... Uh, trying to get rid of just because of whatever reason, but clearly someone dumped it off. Um, so I'll show you an example of this using a different stock just so you can kind of see how it plays out. I'll use an Australian stock just because I know many, many, many stocks in the world. And uh, Australia obviously has some of these as well uh, that do this. So let me have a look around here. Where? Why have I forgotten where it is? <laughs> there it is. Wow, it was so long ago. Holy moly. Oh, time flies, doesn't it? All right. So here was the, the exact same position. So basically, we had this huge rip, then, then got secondly bought up and sold, and it created a dive in the market. Now, it was ultimately purchased. So the earnings ripped the stock up, and then they actually got dumped down, but it ultimately still purchased. 
So I do see this quite a lot. Uh, sometimes it is the end, but I think because the trend has actually been improving, that it's probably not that bad. And I will be, you know, focused in on on how it acts around this exact zone here. It needs a green candle, and it hasn't held that up. So at the moment, this is where the structure lies for the buyer. Uh, is there a BTD person here? Well, we'll soon find out. Also, thank you to the almost 800 people that are joining us here today. Give it a thumbs up if you can. It does help out. Appreciate it very much. Let's go to natural gas now. Natural gas, the widow maker trade, the dangerous position that no one really should be looking at too closely. <laughs> um, Natty gas uh, has come down and it's trading pretty low here overall. And you'll notice that my prediction or my concept here, as I am making a prediction, is this is a very good weekly low, okay, and monthly low. Like it, it's full on structure on the left hand side. I still think it'll do something like this. Like it might make a new low first. It, to stop a freight train from going down takes time. The market has to build a position. And in my opinion, position based trading, understanding positions, understanding building of, longer term structures is going to be one of the last best areas for you to gain edge in markets. Uh, if you ever want to find out more about this type of stuff, we, we do, I actually have a course on it. It's the advanced masterclass. I crap on about this a lot and how I've actually benefited from it over the years as well from a um, perspective of, you know, managing some pretty decent money. So Natty Gas, uh, I wouldn't buy yet myself, uh, but it does have the properties of a potential turn. I need a new low first. I've got an alert for it, and then we'll see what happens. You don't usually buy natural gas, by the way. You generally go for the the stocks, or if you are buying natural gas, you've got to be quick uh, because you will get destroyed in the rolls. Never forget that the fact if you look at fact sheets and the ETFs of Boyle and stuff, there's a reason why if you go to Boyle, and I've said this a million times on this channel, and you go to a weekly and you zoom it zoom it out, it is just a loss on loss on loss, on loss, on loss. Look at that. It's horrible, yeah? So be very, very, very careful when you are trading uh, ETFs. ETF does not mean safety. ETF means uh, exchange-traded fund. So look up fact sheet every time. What about the real widow maker Tesla? Yeah, good one. <laughs> All right. I uh, still like a couple of sectors. We'll look at Tesla in a moment. Still like many, many sectors such as utilities this week. It could be defensive as well if the market falls off. I'm still a fan of utilities. I've obviously been a fan for it for a little while. Um, top utility stocks are interesting at the moment. They're a little bit of a different one that no one else is really looking at. You might say, why the hell do you like utilities? It's just a couple of weeks. I don't really like utilities most of the time. They're usually trash, uh, but sometimes they're okay. Price action is improving on them. Another one that's interesting is Palladium. Uh, it's right at the buy zone in terms of technicals. I've talked a lot about this in our Market Masters Club, which we do live streams like this, a little bit more intense actually, where I go wild. And uh, yeah, this one here is a is a very interesting level. So you've got the inverse head and shoulders. Uh, this is the Palladium ETF. Obviously, there is real cost in that one as well. Um, but it is in, this is basically back at the neckline. So if it's going to improve, this is exactly the area that you would expect palladium to improve. Metals are interesting as well. So XME in general, metals and mining, um, you know, been, been really nice rally here on these, like looking for that to continue to break out. Uh, so they're, they're the stories. A few people asked about snow and SoFi before. Snow is at position base only. It's been getting destroyed. So it, it, it only just found buyers, and I'm talking just found buyers the other day. And you'll notice there's a little bit of volume here on this red candle. All these people got flogged. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just found base. So hopefully you can find some buyers here. What's Cosby? Let's look at wheat next. No way, Kevin. We're not doing that. <laughs> Chris, the widow saver. All right, let's have a look at Tesla. Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. Tesla cannot, cop, cannot get any breaks at the moment. 
uh, <laughs> it probably is over for Tesla in some ways, isn't it? Hopefully they can they can turn it around. Anyway, let's have a look at the stock. So from a price action base, I mean, when I say it's over, it's like all the retail traders that once loved it hate it now, and you know what I mean. Like you'd see the sentiment shifts, huge amounts of sentiment shifts going on around the market. Uh, I still look for this to be taken for ultimate high. I do find it encouraging that there was a buy on Friday uh, for this stock, it's trading down one percent this morning. Stop down below needs to hold. Uh, this structural level is very, very important uh, for Tesla. And if it manages to fail at this zone, so we get underneath another 162, don't instantly bounce it. We're probably going all the way down to you know, some of these big levels down here, 122, 112s. So that would be quite negative. Not a great weekly close ultimately because it's still a doji. So what's that tell us? It means it has no idea on its next direction yet. I'd love to see it above here and above here, you'd be very smiley face. But for now, it's just an interesting position. And some people will be scaling small points up. Thank you very much, friend. Appreciate it. Thank you. Argentine banks are hot. There we go. Kospi is in South Korea. Okay. Thoughts on net. Cloudflare. I like net. It's generally pretty good. Pretty good. I like cybersecurity in general. 96, not really anywhere for me. Uh, I've tra tracked this for a long time. Uh, it's been doing good numbers. I mean, it's up 300%, but off the lows or two to 300%. But yeah, it's not like crowd. So crowd's probably the better of the two. Uh, price action wise, it's pulled back, but hasn't changed trend to the upside yet. Probably mark out 104 for this. Let's have a look at coin and CSX. Sure, let's do both. So Coinbase here. Chris says, Tesla is a car company may be done or at least dropping fast, but the company does interesting stuff. I am not a Musk fan, but I'm definitely cause uh, definitely causes stuff to move along. Yeah, he does make things go pretty fast. Also, if you think about it, Elon generally works best in adversity. So there were times when his companies were almost busto and he worked very well. It depends whether he's going to be more complacent this time or he's going to work in adversity. I don't know what drives him so that'll be an interesting point a coin is going to just be really a price based on bitcoin so are we at a key tp level i would say yes it's a structural zone uh, is this a pullback in time at the moment yes uh, if bitcoin goes above 70k do i think coin will go up uh, yes do i think there's anything worrying about coins price action right now not really but if bitcoin takes that 60 be worried because that's going down. <laughs> Thanks very much for the $6.90 there, friend. Appreciate it. Thank you for the comments as well. Much. Uh, very cool. Thank you. Uh, Palace Plugs says, like Tom said in a recent video, Tesla is a very interesting as a AI data play. In the, for the coming years. Yeah, look, data is everything, guys. That's why, you know, NVIDIA is the beginning of this whole thing and and the end is going to be data. Who has the most, who controls everything from the data perspective? So that's, that's again, my opinion there. Thank you for the $6.90. Now, what was that other stock I was going to do? CSX. Let's have a look at CSX. We'll just go through some more stocks here, see if there's any opportunities. Uh, so that's still holding base. Again, if it manages to break below here, I think that's a problem for it. Uh, something something I will be looking at, but uh, CSX still in an upward trend for now. Weekly, yeah, weekly close, still in an upward trend for now. Uh, somewhere around this 30, yeah, 3671 makes sense where it's buying. And what is it? Railroads. I do like railroads in general, uh, but yeah, it's on support. Tesla has a lot of deferred income that they may draw out in. Otherwise, it'll be a disaster of a Q1. 
Yeah, but sometimes the disasters turn markets. So it'll be sends how bad it really is. Data doesn't need AI. AI needs data. Just something I heard recently. Yep. That's right. That's a good comment. Uh, AI needs data. That's right. That's all that matters. How much data do you have to create Cyber Ron, Cybertron Terminator 15? All right, so let's go through the best plays. Uh, I think the best plays that I'm looking at right now is probably to watch the US 500 at 5175, 5180. That's probably my favorite level of the day in terms of main markets. I was going to enjoy something about AMD if we had something, but with the news coming in from China of a ban on chips, it'll be more of a watch and see how it trades in the morning. So and that's what it is. And then in terms of the other... Stocks that are rallying, most people are going to be on something like Canopy or you're looking at these kind of hyper growth, hyper mag, mad kind of stocks. It might be worth better seeing how a few of these things play out today just because I do think that if the market's going to turn, I mean, this is a statistically interesting week for it. This is the statistically in interesting level that we're looking at. And here, or is it, what's that? You know, <laughs> what what is that? What is this zone? Anyone interested in 5216? Really? Any of you guys interested in that? I don't think I'm interested in that. Let's put an anchored VWAP on the back. I guess you could be interested on the anchored VWAP level. 5215 is an anchored VWAP off that low. Let's put one over here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, other than it being an anchored VWAP, which I had a feeling it might sit there. It's not really, not really the zone I would usually be looking at. Do you see BTC able to hit a market cap of three to four trillion in the next few years? Yes, I do. It's my personal opinion, but yes. Uh, and the answer is quite simple to this. It, but basically, think of it. You you are correct there, David. It's market cap that's most important. Whenever you're considering, you know, people come out with outlandish statements. They'll say, "Oh." You know, NVIDIA is going to $4,000. So that would put it in an $8 trillion market cap. It's probably near impossible just yet to do such a thing. But market cap is the important component. So when you're talking about Bitcoin, if we know that gold is 12 to 13 trillion, if we know Bitcoin is now an alternative asset, which it is, it's an alt asset, whether you like to admit it or not, that's what it is. And you consider ETFs giving the ability, which at the moment they are not still doing it, the ability of inflows of all the alt asset investments inside of books. I could see most people positioning one to even 5% of their portfolios into the alt asset. If that happens, it'll, it'll push a market cap very, very high. Fifteen to twenty trillion is imminent. BTC is flipping gold families. I think that gold is still. I you know I'm I'm positive on gold next couple of years as well. But yeah, you've you've come up with the right idea. B BTC market cap is the most important there. Does BTC usually rise during the halving in April, or does it consolidate and sell the news? Often it's not really. It's already a little bit too high for the overall halving cycle. So generally speaking, if you look at it, what will happen is you'll see a small dip into the halving, you'll see some consolidation after the halving, and then you generally see a rally after that point. Bitcoin also tends to have, if I remember rightly, pretty crappy, is it middles? No, is it rally in the middles? Oh, no, I need to look at the, I'll put it in the next show. I'll put it in the next show. I'll pull the data for you. I've got an Australian home bias for gold. Yeah, I do like iron ore as well, so you can do that. Catalyst to push copper to 4.4, more C more Chinese government stimulus <laughs> for whatever they're going to be doing. Uh, no, actually, the catalyst will be reduction of, of overall production because the production has gone up heavily in copper. So more reduction, that'll get it up there. The, if you can believe it, copper is now like OPEC as of a few weeks ago, which is why we rallied through. 
So that's actually what's occurring there. Things to watch this week, US two-year 4.77. Uh, watch the daily show. I've got a banger coming. I think there's some great stuff to talk about. Have a look at that chart I popped up before at the start as well. If you're ever worried about the current system, I've ranted on these Monday streams many times about how the market is going to be predicated on debt and how we're seeing debt and liquidity become more available. And even though we haven't seen interest rate cuts, that's just what's happening. It is not fair, some people would say. It is just the way it is. And that's because no one wants to deal with the big issues at hand, uh, and no one's ever going to. So it's push it to the next person, and then, oops, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. I think the big problem is going to be, and I'll say this again, is that we're going to have concentrated banks. So this is many years away, by the way, but I think we're going to have concentrated banks. Uh, most, A lot of small banks are going to get eaten by the big banks. Uh, in Australia, we have the big four. In America, you're going to have a big, let's say, eight institutions, and there'll be so all the small ones will be kind of eaten by these big eight institutions. Then they'll all start doing something a little bit unscrupulous, and you all know that turns out bad. So it will repeat. This history does do this. But for now, because they're making liquidity easier to get, that's one of the things driving in. And you do need to remember there's a decent amount of money on the sides. Uh, will there be a correction? I am getting very confident there will be one because we're seeing that JP Morgan thing, which I posted in the last video. And I'll reiterate it to you right now. Would you guys like me to do that? Would you like me to have a look and show you what I'm talking about when I was talking about that thing? I haven't put it in the video yet, but let me let me do it. What do you guys think? You want me to show you what I'm talking about from the uh, the old JP Morgan thing? Let's read a couple of comments here. Lumber should do well as there's still a housing shortage. Yep, housing shortage will be the story. We're going to get that's why uh, home builders is going wild. Have a look at ITB. <laughs> Dave, I think you're a little bit biased, <laughs> but thank you very much. Appreciate it, man. Uh, it's always good. Shame you weren't in Vegas, man. That would have been sweet. Um, crypto is not based on earnings, so they have more upside potential than indices. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, it's just based on it's, everything's based on greed and fear, but you are correct. In this case, it's just super greed. Yep. Okay, let's have a look. All right, you guys want to check it out? So let's check it out. So basically, on that previous chart, what we saw was we had periods in time before uh, markets you know, kind of went up to their euphoric times. And I think probably the most notable one is realistically this one here from 1998. So it's when a market ripped and it was the, you know, midway through that kind of super ripping period. Now, we're not necessarily, no, I actually think we're probably around here. It makes sense because I think we've got a couple more years in us for sure. So let's say this is where we're at. We get this huge corrective bust that comes through. Now, I don't know when the corrective bust is exactly going to happen. Based on that previous chart I showed you at the start, it would say it would be early 225. Uh, but there will be a corrective bust. And those corrective busts actually turn into almost bear markets immediately. So you'll actually see here it goes up from down into a technical bear market within uh, two months. So it's a very quick corrective bust. And then it rallies super hard. I actually think that if we do get a corrective bust, that's what's probably going to happen. And it happened when we had su superiorly overbought momentum periods. Now, we've already had that now for three months. So it can sit for quite a while, but it generally means that one of these will come. And when it does come, you have to have, it, you won't want to be buying. Like that, that's what's going to happen. You will not want to be buying in those periods. Now, in 2008, we also had two that were corrective busts and they weren't as severe as, of course, that particular bubbly one. Uh, but they were still fairly severe. We had 8% corrected bust, and then we had a super corrected bust here, which was near the end of the high, and that was just bought the dip. So these ones here are the ones you're looking for. Generally, times at these particular periods, they're only about 7 to 10%. A really huge corrected bust is 20. Uh, I don't think we're necessarily going to get the 20. I think instead what we'll get is probably around the the 5 to 10, probably the 10 more likely, and it will push down to around this level. So 4,700 uh, would be the, the best you're probably going to get. Now, if that does happen, uh, what the levels that you're going to see taken are going to be 50-90 and 50-50. 
And I think if 50 50 and 50 90 are taken, um, yeah, there's a gap fill here, but more than likely, this is this is a real possibility. So that that'd be the point is. So if you could get that correction, yeah, you say you'd love that correction, but you've got to remember that most people said they would have loved every type of correction under the sun over here as well. Now, I remember very, very closely talking it here about Ford PEs. And, um, you know, during that day, you know, we, we hit a Ford PE underneath 16. Um, that's an amazing DCA level. I mean, it's amazing DCA level. I've crapped on about this for years. You know, if you can get under 16 Ford P, anything under 17 is pretty damn good <clears throat> for Ford P in the current markets. It's generally a buy. Yet no one really wants to buy it down there. That's just how it is. You know, it's because the news, the media, the concepts, they're going to be quite difficult. Even in October of last year, you know, that was, a again, a fairly easy to see set up right now. But I would say that we are on it. The problem is it ripped so quickly for people that they get left behind. You've got to have different plans. Um, so what they've got to be is, you know, there are dec- they are buy the dip style positionings um, for your investments. Okay. Then for your swing trading, you've got to look for the V. So in this case, you know, you probably have to buy it around here or here. Okay. They're the only two places you could really buy it effectively. Um, so those two positions would have been the easiest ones. The 2022 base was actually pretty nice. Uh, it gave you an excellent, excellent entry in here. Um, some nice different bases here. And then obviously this is where, you know, things got a little bit weird because that could have easily gone like this again and then gone up. It didn't. It pushed through and then I waited for that and then boom. Yeah, this this was, I think, you know, certainly a very nice correction. The right side of the V, uh, correct, Ed. That's the thing you've got to do here. Tom has been a wheat cheerleader in long as long as I've been watching. I hate wheat. I lost like, I don't know, a lot of money. I can't remember exactly how much it detonated me, but it was it was something. It's like that PTSD thing. You don't ever think about it again. I'm sure it was over 20,000. It was terrible. Mm. Stupid twister. It was like that was like storm chasing, except I got storm chased. The, the twister hit me in the head. This week is obviously an up week uh, with that. All these shows are lean, bearish. I guess misery loves company. If you are not a, in TECL, TNA, Soxel, you're a dumb ass. This is from Johnny. Uh, defensives will underperform this week. Johnny Algo, the Algo himself. Thank you, Johnny, for your comment. So, <laughs> mate, we've always said semiconductors are very good. They're very, very, very <laughs> look at him go. Oh, man. Hey, at least Johnny Algo picks semiconductors. There's nothing wrong with Johnny Algo's semiconductor pick. Got to love that. This type of market correction usually happens due to some unforeseen global events, but it gets bought right back up. And that's right. It'll be pretty quick if it does happen. I was short ZW looks like uh, long ZC. ZC. Oh, corn futures. <laughs> There's a like cocoa. Corn futures game demolished, demolished recently. Look at how wild they went in the bushels. Is yeah, I hate these things. You know why I hate them? It's the rolls. The futures are so expensive. Can someone else put in the chat that's ever traded at the rolls? April is normally one of the strongest months for the US markets, but it seems too stretched to be worth it. Again, it's just your opinion. The problem is our opinions mean not much. We have to use the price action. And at the moment, I just I just want to always reiterate that, guys. You know, it's very important that you realize we are above the 20 moving average. We are in a bullish trend. We have not got any reasons yet to really be super negative against the market. Uh, at the moment, you can see here that you've got your two days up here. You could be coming into an island reversal. Yeah, but that's only one reasoning. It's not enough. 
I got rule uh, rolled and crude in 2020. Oh, Contango. Yeah, that was nasty. If you don't know what Contango is, I highly suggest you check out Contango. It's where their oil contract went negative, negative dollars. I think it was like negative 20 bucks. And that's wild, <laughs> but it can happen. Um, yeah, in general, contracts like futures contracts can be really, really care, uh, scary. I need water. I got water here. Don't worry. No, my son, my son got, he got the childcare flus. Oh, it's bad. I feel bad for parents that have gone through like many, many kids that have gone to childcare. Ooh, I know, I know not everyone here probably has kids, but my goodness. What types of plagues do they find at these childcare centers? The plague, guys. They should have been tax selling, but that won't happen this year. Yeah, so that's window dressing. Window dressing at the end of March. So generally, that that's why you get that weakness in March, uh, the last week, technically, uh, because you do get that window dressing component. Now, will it occur this year? Mm, time will tell. Again, 51.75 is the key level I'm looking at. All right, guys, we'll leave it there. 51.75, 51.75. Check it out in the US 500. US 2K, 2050, 2040 for the buyers. And the general market is still at this stage bullish. US two-year, 4.7. So we're just doing a recap here. Uh, VIX, obviously, 16, 15 plus. And if it's not doing that, you know, don't worry about it. Google, certainly one we're looking at in the long term. AMD, the big story of the day is AMD, Intel both down. Thanks to China putting and imposing a ban on them. So they're both down around 3 to 4%, uh, taking out new lows as well. How they respond to today's price action will be an important factor. Could it be the start of something? Eh, maybe. Bitcoin, for now, is bullish on the charts. We've already talked about it in great depth at the start. And we looked at that chart, which I hope helped you out. So that chart basically went through the idea of uh, the rallies and where we are right now. So we're basically in a rally that superimposes very well with previous periods. There may be the flash, uh, which is what we were talking about before. So this is the flash and the correction period that, that could happen. But in general, it is a very good correlation across the board. And that's showing that for the next couple of years, we do want to be bullish. Um, will that mean there's not opportunities for traders and investors? Absolutely not. There's going to be awesome trading. There's going to be awesome investing. Make sure to sub to the channel if you enjoy it. Thank you very much for watching. I will hopefully get that update through soon, so it's all going to be good. Uh, friends got some crazy wild um, action. Let's let's see your comments. Where is the S&P 500 going to be at the end of the year? That takes us home. What is your price? S&P 500 by the end of the year, what price have you got? Chuck it in the chat. Let's see. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, they really are. Uh, it's wild. They are. They're pretty bad. 6,200, 5,600, 5,388, 6,255. Big spreads here, 6,000. Uh, I don't know, but I think it touches 6,000 at some point this year. Yeah, it's fair. 5,989. I like that. Just underneath 6K. 150. <laughs> 150. It's a good damn. 150. 4850, 6,000. So most of you got like 6,000 targets. US election, October 4,200, 5,700. Very cool. So a big, big difference. We did a poll this week. The outcome was what did the next 100 point move going to be? Up was 52% and down was 48%. Don't lose sight of the bigger picture, guys. At the moment, it is all about liquidity. At the moment, we have also only just entered into uh, more liquidity being provided by central banks, even though they've been claiming for a long time they haven't been. We've been, of course, tracking that, and we will continue to do so. We'll also be tracking debt leverage in the future. Very important factor for markets. At the moment, still very low, not like 2021. All right. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Ciao, guys.